thanks for your attention. It's always hard to compete with a buffet. Um, I'm here to talk to you about cardiac devices just to get them on your radar because of this popular opinion. And everywhere I go, I see patients with stickers on them whose rhythm has been monitored on the ward or in emergency or on the echo table. And the people monitoring that ECG are not actually thinking about the rhythm because they expect that the device will make sure it will be perfect. And that's just not true. So they're not seeing the device function, they're not thinking about the device function, and they're certainly not commenting about the device function. And I'm proposing that we can do better than that. Pacemakers can cause malfunction, they can cause harm to patients, and the pacemaker patient that you are looking after, it may be 10 or 11 months since they last had their pacemaker checked. As sonographers, we are already noticing the rhythm. It's routine to comment on the heart rate, to make a comment as to whether they're in atrial fibrillation or sinus rhythm. We mention the blood pressure, and we might go so far as to saying there's some hardware in there. Um, but if you think about why we include this information in our echo report, it's because it helps with image interpretation. It helps us guide therapeutic decisions. And if you're not thinking about device function, then you may well be missing actionable findings. A very good quote for all of medicine is that you only see what you look for and you only recognise what you know. So if you don't know what you're looking for, there could be major problems right in front of your face and you won't even see them. So my goal is to give you some things to recognise so that you learn to pay just enough attention that you can bring in the heavy weights um, if you think there might be a problem. So I'm going to get pacing on your radar, pacemaker performance. I'm going to encourage you to develop basic device literacy. I'm going to give you some red flags which I hope you'll recognise if you come across them and you will come across them in your daily practice. And in doing all of this, I'm going to strengthen your relationship with your pacemaker people. Um, so once again, you only see what you look for. You only recognise what you know. And if you only focus in the box of the echo, then you may be missing the wider picture. Um, and that could make a big difference to the patient. So the, the scenarios that I'm about to show you are real examples that, from my real clinical experience, where what I've noticed while paying attention to the echo has made a big difference to the patient. People sometimes fail to even notice that there's a pacemaker there or a, another cardiac device there. And an example where this could have been a major problem for the patient was a simple transesophageal echo precardio version request. So I turned up to do um, a device check post procedure. So they did the toe, they did the cardio version with the pads in the right place, and then I did the device check to make sure that we hadn't cooked the can. And rather embarrassingly, what we found is that the toe was completely unnecessary because the AF duration in the device's logbook meant that the toe wasn't even needed. So when, AF, when atrial fibrillation duration is unknown, it's a good idea to remind your colleagues that all these devices keep a logbook and that can be very helpful in knowing how to manage the patient. So logbooks will to show you all about the arrhythmias and they can be very helpful with making clinical decisions. And additional arrhythmias or patient activity, there's a heart rate variation, there's all sorts of information in there that can be relevant to the clinician. So another example, this is one just from last week. I had a referral in the echo lab to see a patient who was in emergency who had a syncopal episode. They came up to the echo lab for me to do the echo and um, I found a loop recorder. <laughs> I had a conversation with the patient, sure enough, they'd had this loop recorder put in to diagnose the cause of syncope. But some bright spark down in emergency thought that the best check for them was an echo. So he, he had a, a loop recorder interrogation as well because I knew that that would be helpful. Um, so any patient who's got these very typical stroke, uh, these very typical echo referral um, indications, so strokes, collapse, palpitations, the device data might be, might be useful. Now it's still important to do the echo and perhaps while you're doing the echo, keep an eye on the rhythm because pacemaker malfunction or um, 
variations in the heart rhythm could be a clue as well as the images that you're getting. So here's a suspicious rhythm. If you have a patient who's been having collapses and you see a, a rhythm like this, you probably should see it. You probably should think about it, maybe even talk to your pacemaker team about it, and you definitely should comment on it. So if you're not keeping half an eye on that, you, you may miss an actionable finding. Now, this rhythm may or may not be pacemaker malfunction. There are algorithms which mimic, mimic malfunction. You don't have to be the complete expert, but you should be paying some sort of attention. So just to remind you how to think about pacemaker rhythms, pacemakers, and I'm talking about a typical dual chamber pacemaker, they're there to make sure that the heartbeat starts, that you get that filling, and to make sure that the heartbeat finishes, so you get the emptying. And that's what the pacemaker is supposed to do, make sure that we have an adequate tempo and that the ventricle follows the leader in the correct sequence. So that helps to make it simpler to think about starting the heartbeat, finishing the heartbeat. Um, just because there's a pacemaker there doesn't mean it's actually in charge. So a well-programmed pacemaker is like your favourite relative who will come to the rescue, but she's not interfering. She doesn't um, give you a hard time or try and take, take control when you're already managing beautifully by yourself. So pacemakers are programmed to avoid unnecessary pacing. And um, that means that we see a range of, of, of rhythms. Sometimes the patient is not paced at all. They're sensing the, vent the atrium, they're sensing the ventricle. Sometimes they're starting the heartbeat. Sometimes the pacemaker's helping to finish the heartbeat. Sometimes the pacemaker's doing everything. And you could see all four of these traces in the one patient. So that's what you need to be looking for. And I challenge you to actually comment on the rhythm that you see. So instead of just saying the rate was such and such, that you actually say, this is a, paced in the atrium, sensed in the ventricle rhythm, or maybe this patient is 100% paced in the ventricles because they've got a biventricular pacemaker. Put a little comment on the, on the report. And um, to help you with that, it's good to have access to the pacemaker record. You can kind of cheat by looking at the last check and seeing if they're 100% ventricular paced or if they're 100% atrial paced. Now, is this actually helpful? Why would we bother to comment on that? And once again, we're looking for actionable findings when we see patients. This particular trace was from a very young man having an echo who happened to have a device. And um, it wasn't a request for, for you know, complex resynchronization or anything like that. So whether or not this um, e to A wave fusion, which is caused by a long PR interval, whether or not that's actually a problem depends on whether or not this patient has their AV delay controlled by the device. If it's controlled by the device, then we have control over that AV delay. And in this particular patient, look at the difference we made. If I hadn't been paying attention, I wouldn't have realised that we could improve his diastolic filling time by 20%. And this is a fellow my age with heart failure. Can't hear me? <laughs> Come a bit closer. <laughs> It's going to be on the website. You'll hear me on the website. Yeah, you're most welcome to come forward. Um, so these are your red flags. If you are scanning any patient who has complete heart block or who has a high ventricular pace percentage and you see an AV delay like any of those, then that is a red flag. You should be mentioning it in your report. You should be involving your pacemaker team. Um, in the pacing lab, I have very different tools to the tools that I have in the echo lab. And a lot of the pacemakers will promise you when you press the buttons that they have already optimised the timing. And we don't have the tools in the pacing lab to know whether or not that's a lie. And for many of our patients, it's actually not accurate. And so we need you to use your tools in the echo lab to help us to do a better job in the pacing lab. So reminding, think about the starting and the finishing of the rhythms. DDD mode typically gets the ventricle to follow the atrium. And another scenario I'd like you to be able to recognise is what happens in the context of atrial arrhythmias. If the atrium's going at 300 beats a minute, 
DDD mode will try and force the ventricle to keep up, which is clinically not a safe scenario. So modern pacemakers are designed to change their thinking and to stop tracking once the atrium gets to a certain level. But it doesn't always work as well as the advertising says it should. So here's an example of, of two patients. This is like when you're dis differentiating between constriction and restriction. Your, your presentation may be the same, but what you do for that patient will depend on what's involved. And we really want to know if the pacemaker is colluding in the patient's tachycardia or if the patient's racing on their own because we can fix it sometimes with a, with a programming adjustment. So here's a case study. This heart rate is going at about 160 beats per minute. We can see a narrow QRS complex. Patients feeling unwell because their heart's racing. And um, if you look up the pacemaker parameters and can see that the upper track rate tells us the pacemaker is not allowed to go faster than 130, then you know that this rhythm is intrinsic. So you can move on with the rest of your echo and know that there's not a pacemaker problem behind that rhythm. Um, and if you're unsure of the rhythm, you can cheat and get the pacemaker people to show you the atrial intracardiac ECG and actually see what the rate is in the atrium. Here's another case study where the pacemaker is the problem. And I've made it easy for you because I've shown the atrial trace. Um, we've got a broad complex. That may or may not be the case depending on where the leads are positioned. But the giveaway here is that the rate never goes above the upper track rate. So in this instance, we can make that patient feel better. There is no reason for somebody to sit on the ward for two days waiting for their echo so the sonographer can interpret the rhythm problem. And that is what happens in, in more than one scenario I could tell you about. Um, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then you don't see it. And here's a bonus case study. Um, if the patient's upper track rate coming out of the pacemaker factory in the pacemaker box is set at 130 and the patient is 20, then they're going to wank it back every time they exercise. It's important to know that this is normal pacemaker function in the context of complete heart block when the atrium outruns the ventricle, uh, sorry, outruns the pacemaker. Um, and another context where it's important to know about this is if you have a patient getting angina, you may want to deliberately back off that track rate to make them winky back rather than allow the pacemaker to collude in the rates that are giving them angina. Um, so important to recognise. So my final case study, and I'm calling this a dramatic one, um, this was a resus case and the patient had a, a single chamber defibrillator and they were in the resus war, um, room looking very, very unwell. And I'll just work through. Clinically, they had a sensation of fullness in the head and neck and pounding and pulsing in the neck and cannon waves visible in the jugular vein. I'm not sure if my video will show here. No, it won't. Cannon waves in the jugular vein look like a little tick going tick, 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 tick in time with a heartbeat. And they're a sign of disrupted um, AV synchrony. So when the ventricle is following the leader, then the blood moves forward the way it's supposed to. In this instance, the pacemaker function in the defibrillator was set to 40 to stay out of the way of the natural rhythm, which didn't need pacing. They only gave him a single chamber wire because it wasn't there to pace, it was there to detect tachyarrhythmias. And unfortunately, um, prior to the presentation in emergency, somebody had looked at the device, said, this is in VVI, they must be in chronic AF, I can put the heart rate wherever I want. And for this patient, Putting the ventricle faster than the atrium triggered V to A conduction. So the wrong chamber was following the leader. And when the atrium contracts at the wrong time on the back of the R wave, it hits closed valves and the blood goes up the neck. And that's why you get the cannon waves. It hits the baroreceptors. And this poor gentleman had a systemic blood pressure response and, um, and felt really lousy. So before I even ultrasounded this patient, I knew what the problem was because I recognised the pattern. And it was a dramatic case because they had flagged him for palliation. They were going to turn off his defib and say, let's, take, let's let nature take its course. And he had seen a number of physicians in emergency and nobody else had picked it. Um, when I turned him 
to a more appropriate rate and allowed the ventricle to follow the atrium again. Before my eyes, his blood pressure improved by 30 millimetres of mercury and this patient is doing very well. So in another context, just to show you more of the same physiology so that you recognise it, would be atrial pace failure. So if the atrium is activated the atrium and then the ventricle is activated, then the blood flows properly. But if there's something wrong with that lead or it's dislodged, then you may find that you get the same um, pacemaker syndrome physiology. And it, it's not always symptomatic. It may be negligible or it may be catastrophic, but you need to know what you're looking at to see it. And um, I hope that you've gotten something out of that presentation. Thank you.